Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast featuring garden history and literature. I'm Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is February 9th. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birth of Samuel Thompson, who was born on this day in 1769. Samuel was a self-taught New Hampshire holistic doctor and herbalist. In 1809, he was tried and acquitted for the murder of Ezra Lovett after treatment with Lobelia inflata, an herb commonly called pukeweed that Samuel regarded as a key to treating disease. Despite his iconoclast approach to medicine, Samuel's herbal remedies and vapor baths were popular, and his followers were known as Thompsonians. In addition to Lobelia, Samuel primarily used herbs like barberry bark, red clover, and cayenne. In his New Guide to Health, written in 1833, Samuel wrote, I have made use of cayenne in all kinds of disease and have given it to patients of all ages and under every circumstance that has come under my practice. It is no doubt the most powerful stimulant known, but its power is entirely congenial to nature, being powerful only in raising and maintaining that heat on which life depends. And today is the birthday of Henry Arthur Bright. He was born on this day in 1830, He was an English gardener and writer. Henry began a diary, which would become a book that was called A Year in a Lancashire Garden. It's one of my favorites. In February of 1873, Henry was doing what gardeners do this time of year, cleaning up and editing the garden for the new season, looking through garden catalogs, and mulling over unappreciated plants like the humble spring crocus. Here's what he wrote. But all things are now telling of spring. We have finished our pruning of the wall fruit. We have sown our earliest peas. We've been looking over old volumes of Curtis's Botanical Magazine and have been trying to get old forgotten plants of beauty and now of rarity. We have found enough, however, to add a fresh charm to our borders for June, July, and August. I sometimes think that the crocus is less cared for than it deserves. Our modern poets rarely mention it, but in Homer, when he would make a carpet for the gods, it is of lotus, hyacinth, and crocus. And today is the birthday of Alice Walker, the American novelist, short story writer, poet, and social activist. She was born in 1944. In 1982, she published The Color Purple, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. In her book, In Search of Our Mother's Garden, that was written back in 1983, Alice wrote these words, In Search of My Mother's Garden, I Found My Own. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Wardian Case by Luke Keough. This book came out in late 2020, and the subtitle is How a Simple Box Moved Plants and Changed the World. When Australian Luke Keough set out to tackle the topic of the Wardian Case, he was working in Munich on an Anthropocene exhibit and curating a piece about how goods had been moved around the globe. And that topic led him to the topic of the Wardian case. Wardian cases are a great topic. They're fascinating. And the original Wardian cases are getting harder and harder to find. There are only 15 known right now in the world. Well, for all their miraculous functionality, Wardian cases are actually quite simple. They essentially are wood boxes with a glass top, and the box could be filled with potted plants or be layered with bricks, moss, and soil, and then have plants potted directly into the box. 
Luke's book is a look back, not only at the cases, but the inventor of the Wardian case and the man that they were named for, Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward. Nathaniel's story began in 1829 when he was struggling to grow plants. He lived close to the London docks, and there was a lot of air pollution back then, which wasn't suitable for plants or people. Anyway, Nathaniel was a lifelong naturalist, and he decided that he wanted to create this perfect environment for a moth to grow in. And so he settled on using a large bottle, and then he put a moth pupa in the bottle along with some plants. And as he was waiting all month long for this moth pupa to hatch, he realized that he had a beautiful little fern growing in the biosphere that he had created. And he was suddenly struck by how well that fern had grown in that sealed environment, as opposed to in his home garden. Dagger in the heart. Very relatable. Anyway, that was the inspiration for the Wardian case, which was essentially the precursor to the terrarium. Nathaniel experimented for years with the Wardian case before finally creating a case that could be used on ships and long voyages and made it possible for explorers to bring back live specimens. His first case went all the way to Australia. Ward waited anxiously for seven months for the ship to return, and he was pleased to hear from the captain that his case was a grand success. In fact, halfway through the journey, the plants were doing so well that they had to prune back some of that top growth during the voyage. In his book, Luke Keogh shares these and many other fascinating stories about Ward and his cases and how they transformed plant exploration, the food that we eat, and the world at large. For instance, Ward himself was passionate about having windowsill boxes in the homes of the lower class so that they could grow plants in their home. Luke's book offers wonderful insights, history, images, and maps of trade routes very fascinating to help contextualize the importance of this simple yet profound invention. You can get a copy of the Wardian Case by Lou Keo and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $25. Finally, today's Botanic Spark features the American poet Amy Lawrence Lowell, who was born on this day in 1874. In 1926, Amy posthumously won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry for a collection that included her popular poem, Lilacs. Today, I thought I'd take an excerpt from her poem, Madonna of the Evening Flowers. Amy wrote, You tell me that the peonies need spraying, that the columbines have overrun all bounds, that the pyrus japonica should be cut back and rounded. You tell me these things. Well, that's it for today's show. Just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org, where you can also show your support for the show by donating to The Daily Gardener. This is Jennifer E. Blaine. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.